Yet again, I find myself in Goshen, Indiana for the Midwest Rep Rap Festival. I'm Joel, and this is 3D Printing Nerd. From the beginning, there's been someone that has been at Murph, and that's John Oley here. Hey, John. How you doing? I remember meeting you first at Bay Area Maker Faire some long time ago, and I remember you relayed the story of Murph to me, but for those that don't know, could you let us know how it started? Yeah, so it was 2012, like winter of 2012, I think. Um, I was on the RepRap IRC channels, and we were talking, a couple, couple of us got together and said, hey, how about one one weekend this winter we get together, I'll buy pizza, you bring, bring the beer. There we go. I'll throw a heater in my garage and we'll hang out. And uh, 300 people showed up. 300 people. 300 Whose people garage was from this? the IRC channel. <laughs> um, it was actually the Maker Hive. Oh, okay. Uh, we obviously outgrew my garage, so. Look what yeah, it's grown to. I know, it's pretty awesome. What has been a surprise along the way? Has something been born of Murph or happened at Murph that you thought, I never thought this was possible? Or well, besides I, I, Murph? Besides Murph. No, okay, besides, besides Murph. Murph um, there are a lot of like little niche businesses that have come out of Murph. B3, their Pico Hot Ends, mm. um, Jim Spencer and the the Phila Blend guys this year. Oh, that's, I saw that. That's we got saw the that. material that award for best in show yeah. right there. That's pretty cool. Um, lots of cool printer designs and crazy off the wall ideas. And uh, having these kind of people all around, nobody's afraid to show off something really crazy. Well, that kind of that's kind of cool. You see not only people from all over the globe coming here, but companies that are competing with each other, it doesn't matter, they still all come to this event and it's all about the community. If not all year round, at least for one weekend, <laughs> we're all friends. It's like that. No, thing. yeah. It's, it's like that Christmas during the really war is. when the Germans it's, and the Americans stopped fighting. Right? Yeah, there's that, that Christmas treaty, but no. <laughs> I mean, I'm not gonna say we don't talk to people that wanna be a sponsor first, because there's a lot of people that, that inquire every year that we say, well, let's let's talk about what Murph is before you decide if you want to come or not. Uh, so everyone that shows up is is genuine and honest, and they're community facing. Right. Uh, if you've been on Twitter anytime recently, you've seen the Tiki Project by my buddy Jim here. He brought it to Murph. Hey, Jim. Hi. Talk about the the Tiki Project and what all went into making that. So the Tiki Project is my homage to the uh, Enchanted Tiki Room at Walt Disney World or Disneyland in your case. <laughs> yeah. And, West Coast. Uh, yeah, West Coast. So it's it's pretty much a duplicate of the, a smaller version of the uh, Tiki Room there. It does all the animatronics, it does all the songs, lights, and it was just a passion project that I wanted to put together because I'm such a Disney animatronic fan. Okay. And it was something that I felt after going through multiple projects that I was ready to do and I had the ability to do it. Wow, it, it looks amazing. Thanks. Were there any personal challenges you had to overcome before creating something like this? Well, the first project I did was I had a year's worth of learning electronics because all I could do was make something blink. <laughs> Everybody starts with blink, right? So a year of my life was just figuring out how to get past blink. And once I figured out that code in my previous projects, the electronics were trivial. This was more of a 3D printing uh, CAD challenge. It's, you okay. know, it's not rectangles and stuff. It's got fillets and spheres and how do you assemble this and you I don't print huge I got a smaller printer how do you print and not make things warp oh and so this wasn't just a large print you printed small pieces and th had to this, put them th together this and is, process this them. is a Lulzbot mini six inch volume printing this wow. so this is a lot of assembly and trial and error so that parts don't split parts don't so moving to PETG uh, solved a lot of those problems oh really yeah so the front faces and everything are PLA because there's no load bearing stuff but all the uh, totem itself is all PETG and assembled PETG. Um, it allows you to have uh, parts that have a little give to them. They're not brittle, so if anything were to tip over or anything, it'd probably be just fine. Oh. And it's also more heat resistant if you have it in a car and you're traveling to Murph. Oh, oh that would be terrible if you had Sad, to... you open your trunk <laughs> yeah. and this is a pile of goo. Oh, so, well, it, it looks amazing. You do you know, have some other stuff here. Mm -hmm. What's going on with the, the eyeballs right okay. here? Okay, so the eyeballs... What I uh, originally, these were the eyeballs from my original project three years ago. This was actually the blue hips parts were my first prints besides the Roctopus off my printer when I bought it back three, four years ago. Okay. So the idea here was if, let's, let's, if I can animate a pair of eyes, you can duplicate those and the con you can duplicate that into a mouth and you can build an animatronic from there. You just need to, you need a, a, a base to, to work from. 
And uh, the eye project here was just a simplified version of all these animatronics. If you can make this, you can make, you can expand it and make anything. So I said, before I went to Murph, I'm like, if I can take the guts out of this and put them on display and have kids come up and, and, and try it and show them how easy it is, once you've got the code already to program it the way you want to and make it move, then the kids can be excited about that and say, I did this, you know, I could go work with my family, we could go build this. And um, it sounds inspiring. It, can you show us how it works? Uh, sure. So take 10 seconds here. So we got a, a eyelid input here and you got your eyeballs. And when this light turns on, which will be about three more seconds, there we go. So you can open them, look around. And that's you controlling everything. Yep, yep. That's, that's live controlling. And about five seconds, it should shut off. And there you go. And I can set that down. And now the program remembers exactly what I did. And it'll play that back ad nauseum until I tell it to stop. <laughs> which, <laughs> on a very basic scale, is how this animatronic here works and how the tiki works. I puppet the mouth, which instead of eyes, using this, and it's whenever you hit go, it just plays back what it remembers. So you don't have to go in there and code every little number for every little movement. You just puppet what you want, kind of like a Muppet, <laughs> and it remembers it and you're done. So you can record it in five minutes or less and be ready to go. But this, this basic example showcases a really advanced thing. I mean, yes. this, this breaks it down to the most simplistic terms that kids and adults can understand, but yes. it's so powerful. Just watching it play back, it looks lifelike, and yes. all you did was yeah. use a mouth, like a, like an opening close yeah. and a little switch yeah. to move yeah. it back if, and if forth. If you use numbers and you put in, you had to put in positions, it, you, the playback is not very organic. It's very, you know, stop, go, stop, go. He, the human body puts in the motions and the slowdowns and the accelerations themselves, so you don't have to program that. You just do what you feel like with your hands and it remembers every little motion you did. That's so it makes cool. it very simple. Jim, what's going on here? So I remember a video you put out on Twitter, I think. And yeah. this was singing, is that right? Yes, this is my first animatronic. My parents, well not my parents, my dad and my uncle both built what they call Igor robots back in the 90s for Halloween, which was much more simple, but electronics weren't readily available as much back then. So <laughs> it's really impressive. So I realized, I went back and said, shoot, they made that when they were 34. Oh crap, I'm 29 at the time. I need to get on this. So at 32, I finished this one. This was my homage to, to their projects. And I themed it somewhat in the Haunted Mansion theme. <laughs> so he's wearing his, his suit and tie from the Haunted Mansion. He's proper. Yeah, he's proper and dapper. But this has nine servos in it. Has the eyeballs that I just did in his skull. If you crack the skull open, that's what you'd find. Eyebrows move, mouth moves, head, sound, audio, lights. And it was my first project in, to show off the electronics uh, that I designed. Originally. Well, that's amazing. Thank you. That is amazing. And we'll get some footage of him moving around. But Jim, okay. I got one final question yes. for you. Yes. Can I hit the button? You can hit the button. I'll stand back and shield myself. You ready, Sean? Here, I'll even pick it up because it's. Okay. Oh, hey, it's a wireless go. button. Of course. You've got to do wireless. Well done, Jim. Thank you. I, and good to finally meet you in person. Good to meet you. <laughs> okay, here we go. Tom. Hey, Joe. Welcome to Murph. Thank you. Good to what, meet you. What a freaking show. Good to meet it's, you too, man. It's insane how many people are here. It's crazy. Uh, I, I really, I just, I wanted to meet you because I wanted to give you my sticker. Oh, well, thank you. You get a little robot, You know Joe. what? Oh, do you have stickers Here's too? Here's my sticker. Oh, look at that. Oh, look. Oh, so nice. So nice. <laughs> I talked about Chris on my channel before and I featured his channel because he does awesome stuff. Chris is here at Murph. Hey, Chris. Hi. Joelbot is huge. The biggest one I've ever seen. How did how did you print it? What, what, I see, I remember when I printed mine huge, there was some wobble. Mm -hmm. And you don't have wobble. How did you make that happen? I do have wobble. I just figured out how to stop it. I, I, how did you <laughs> stop it? When you print something tall and skinny, as it goes up, you have two things that are trying to move the print. You have the bed moving, which is inertia. It's going to make the object move. Then you also have the actual pressure of the nozzle pushing on the layer, which is going to make it do this. I actually have some pens I can show you later that demonstrates that. So when I print something tall, this has two problems, skinny legs. So when I print something like this that's tall, 
no big deal. No big because deal. Because the surface area at the bottom is so large that it's self-reinforcing. Ah, okay. okay. That makes but sense. But when I print something like this, these legs are tall and skinny. Right. Now, with this multi-piece one, it wasn't as big a deal until I got to this part. So what I do is this printed, and you get to this waist part here. It's too weak. So here's the print bed. I take a stick of some sort, usually a bamboo skewer. You yeah. can get them in any length, they're cheap. Oh, yeah. And you, you literally put a blob of hot glue on the model, put the bamboo skewer on it, blob of hot glue on your print bed, bamboo skewer, and now the model's reinforced. You build, you build scaffolding for the literally. model on the As plate. the model got higher, I would add more scaffolding. So when I did That's the brilliant. marble print one all in one piece, mm -hmm. I put reinforcements here at the hips because the legs are skinny. And then once I got to the chest, I put reinforcements here. And once it got to the about this height here, I added a reinforcement to the arm and a reinforcement to the chin. Oh. And that stops it from wobbling. It'll print without it, but the quality difference is pretty huge. You right. don't have those layer shifts of the model wobbling back and forth. And also, less likely to get a collision and break a piece off. That makes sense. Plus, hot glue, super easy. Comes to remove right off. You're done. You just get a cheap little you know, $20 hot glue gun, put a blob on, you're done. That's a great idea, Chris. And of course, you got a little tiny Jolbot on the shoulder there. Oh yeah, there. that's a little resin print. That is Sweet. a 23 millimeter Jolbot. It's tiny. I tried to go smaller, but you <laughs> lose so much detail, there's no point. Right, yeah. right. So that's about as small as you can practically go. Maybe on a Piopoli Moli, you can do better. Well, Jolbot needs to work out a little bit and get his legs in <laughs> shape, so that as, maybe you can go a little bit smaller. As far as I'm aware, this is the largest and smallest Jolbot in existence. I, I, so, I although, have no... Nothing to dispute that with. Sixty-seven percent full Joel, That's and I hear someone's working on one hundred percent. I, I would love to see it. <laughs> so would I. Hey Chris, good to meet you. In Thank person, you so man. much, my friend. Thanks for bringing all this. Got stuff. a couple Joel bots for you. Oh, let's see. This is a fifty millimeter, so he's got some good details. Oh man, look at that! You can even read the three DPN on the chest. That's not bad. And then just for shiggles, you can join the nanite swarm. There we go. As we oh, go to take over the world. Let's hope they don't become self-aware. And then you like your little starship, so I do like starship. A little oh, resin starship. starship. Spaceship. <laughs> oh, thanks, Chris. No problem. That's great. fantastic. Oh, no. Run away, Joelbot. Joelbot down. Hi, Kelly. Hi. How's, how's Joelbot? He's doing really good. He's very relaxed. He's had a lot of massaging going on so far. <laughs> What's the yeah. process here for painting Joelbot? So I'm using this paint called Rub and Buff on him. Um, and you do typically use your fingers. I've been using a brush in the little details. But it's a metallic uh, wax base paint. So I'm rubbing it all over him. Um, I'm going to make him look kind of steampunk style. Um, so use the rub and buff paint all over him, and I'll go back with acrylic to do the detail work. Uh, kind of antique. I'm going to patina your symbol here. So, yeah. Well, so this will be done in a couple hours? Um, I, That's optimistic. It'll be done today. It'll be done. Hopefully it'll be okay. done today. Okay, we'll yeah. see it done today. <laughs> well, I'll let you get back to it. Thanks, Thanks. Kelly. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> Murph isn't complete without awesome models such as this. Hey, Garrett. Hey. Talk about the Iron Giant build. Sure. So, uh, first of all, I created this in Fusion 360. Um, it took about 25 hours of modeling, uh, 10 hours just to get the model, um, somewhere in the ballpark of 15, posing it and splitting it up for the different printers and stuff like that. I saw the video. I mean, yeah. it, it, took, it took a while. That was crazy. And then Hogarth down there was print or modeled in ZBrush, took uh, about four hours in ZBrush to That's create it? that. Yeah. Wow. I, I've gotten pretty good. They have some pretty good tools in there to make the body really, really simple. So, oh, so you can you can get the primitives out really quick. Yes. And then just add details. It's called Z spheres. You just basically pull spheres out and it becomes a body really quickly. So then you can just go in and add details. Most of the time is spent in the face. Is that like cheating? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I call it being efficient. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I love about this model is the Iron Giant is just such a, a wonderful movie. The character is fantastic. And the, the pose that you have it in yeah. is with Hogarth is brilliant. So I saw the the video where you you had the image where you posed it standing up. Yes. How did you get it posed into a kneeling position? So I modeled it keeping it in mind that I was gonna do this pose. So there's a few things that I, like I spent a lot of time figuring out how the joints actually work in the movie. So I would, you know, I watched the movie a couple times and found a ton of reference images online and figured out, you know, the, these are ball joints, so they're pretty simple, but how like the, the pistons on the back of the legs work and stuff like that. And so I just kept all that in mind while I was modeling it kept it all separate pieces so then when I had it fully modeled I could just kind of rotate things and Fusion 360 has a smart rotate feature so you can set the pivot point of the rotate so I just set it to the center of this ball and then it just swings the arm like it like it should oh so this entire model I, 
off that sketch was was modeled in Fusion 360. And yeah. And the posing was in three, Fusion 360. Yes, it was. Wow, Garrett, this is emotional. I know that was the I love this. that was the one thing I knew that we had to do with this. I'm just like Iron Giant. That that scene is so powerful, and it's one of my favorite movies. So it's like, if we do this, we have to be able to convey this scene and all the emotion that comes with it. The thumbnail for the video is probably one of the best thumbnails I've ever seen. Well, I appreciate that. That's so good, dude. Congrats. Thank you. Thank so you, sir. Much. Hey, Chuck. Hey, Joel. I can't come to Murph without stopping by your booth. I mean. We're, we're rooming in the same hotel and you give me a ride in your car to lunch. Thanks for the McDonald's, but I wanted to stop by your booth because there's cool I'll stuff here. I'll send you here. a bill later. I appreciate that. You have this large Delta. Talk about this, please. Yeah, I am so lucky. I now have an Artemis coming to Filament Friday. I am so excited about this. It's the CMEC Artist, Artemis and it's my first Delta. I finally have a Delta on the channel, and this thing is enormous. It's, it's huge. Your first, this is like the Delta of all Deltas, and I, it's your first. I'm hitting a home run. I'm yeah. first time at bat, right? So I'm really excited to get this running. We put it together here, and I still got some wiring to do, but we're going to have this on Film on Friday. It's going to be awesome. What's the time frame? Um, we have probably, I mean, got to get through Murph and away from all this stuff, but Couple Probably weeks within, like two, two, within two weeks, we'll have this guy running. Two weeks? Two weeks, we'll have this guy running. Okay. Uh, is this, and you're going to run this through it, I suspect. And this is what I want to run. We've got our own Filament Friday filament. I'm <laughs> real excited about this. And it's we've been testing, finding the best filament, but affordable. And use this for all the Filament Friday projects. So if somebody wants to build something, they can use the exact same filament I'm using. If someone wants to buy something, it helps the channel a little bit. But the main thing is... I'm picking the filament. I'm testing the filament, and I'm just really excited. So this is going to be used in a lot of the projects going forward. Cool. And eventually, it's not for sale yet, but it'll soon be available on Amazon. So people can get it from the channel, or they can get it on Amazon. There you go. Well, what's next to the filament? Talk about this little thing now, this right here. This little guy here, you know I like the CR-10 and the CR-10 Mini, which we've got. Um, and this is the CB-10. That wait, 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 CB10. CB10. Okay. I'm sorry, don't remember his name. His initials are CB. <laughs> He's got a Facebook group. I think it's Colin Bryan or something like that. But, okay. But shout, the, out really the, cool, shout out to all the Colin Bryans. <laughs> well, it's really cool. It's all 3D printed brackets, so you can build a CR10. So I'm taking the pieces and trying to build a CR10 mini. Because oh. we're here at RepRap. you got to have RepRap at RepRap, <laughs> that, Absolutely. Right? So that's what this is my RepRap printer. Right here, we're gonna clone a clone of a clone. How about that? That's fantastic. Chuck, you have some wonderful things coming up. I can't wait to see it. You know I subscribed to you. Best of luck to you, my friend. Thank you, man. Thanks. It's not Murph until Joel interviews me. <laughs> now it's officially Murph. Now it's Murph. <laughs> Great. Now it's Murph. High five. Hey, Scott. Hey, Joel. <laughs> it's glitter. What the heck, man? What are you doing? So. This is actually um, an old Z Corp, a Z402. This actually, this machine actually came out in 1997. So this machine's like 21 years old, give or take. Um, it used to have like an inkjet head on it. It was one of the inkjet machines that used like gypsum powder, give or take. Um, but what I did was I scrapped all the gypsum powder, I replaced all the electronics, and I filled it with glitter. So now it's a because you're a mad scientist, uh -huh. that's what you are. So now it's a selective laser center. So it basically centers together glitter. Wait, you can you can SLS glitter? You can. Uh, believe it or not, glitter is made of PET, which is just a normal printing filament, uh, plated with a little bit of aluminum and then some polyester on top. Oh, that burns, doesn't it? A little bit, but there's not that much of it. Oh, really? Yep. Oh, okay. it's, it's enough that I can just torch it and it doesn't have any. It has never lit on fire before, so. Well, or at least not goals. yet. <laughs> yeah, What's post processing, or how do you treat the model when it's done? So as of now, I'm just kind of seeing if I can make parts. As you can see by my. Uh, realm of broken pieces it's actually kind of annoying because the parts kind of just turn to dust when you pick them up but oh. they hold enough together to hold them together long enough to get them into say a resin right so, oh. so you can produce this and then you can just cast it in resin so okay. it's not the best print or well, the quality is interesting because it doesn't need any support material so you can just print one without needing any support material or you can just stack them up and you can just print a whole pack of them, right? Oh, okay. So the actual concept is good. Um, I need to get either a more powerful laser or I need to find a way to mess with the material properties a bit uh, to actually get it to melt together better. But as of now, the theory is here. 
got the theory going. So what's your end? Do you have an end game in mind? Do you want to productize something like this? Um, probably not, being that it's based off of an old machine that hasn't been used in you know years. Um, I know SLS machines are pretty rare, so people don't really work with them that much. This one, I'm not sure exactly what the future of this machine will be. I'm probably going to put a bigger laser on it, on it, and see if I can do like nylons, like powdered nylon. Um, the problem I ran into that was that no one would sell it to me because no one wants to sell it to you know random people in quantities less than like one ton. <laughs> yeah. So I managed to get all this glitter on eBay. Somebody was selling 50 pounds of glitter for $120, so I'm like, I'll buy it. So managed to get four buckets of glitter and. Uh, load up my machine enough and fill up my entire apartment with glitter. So. That's amazing and terrible all at the same time. Uh -huh. Dude, good luck. Yeah, good luck on this. Yeah. And uh, is there anywhere people can go to find out about this project? So I've got a website, uh, scottziv.com, S-C-O-T-T, -T, Z as in zebra, I as in indigo, V as in victor.com. Um, and that's kind of just my blog of random projects. Um, the issue I ran into with this one, for example, is the Motors aren't stepper motors. They're DC servo motors. Oh, really? So I had to find a way to build a board to take the step direction and enable signals out of the uh, standard ramps board that I'm using and convert those into DC quadrature closed loop control. Okay. And so that was a bit of a challenge that I have documented up there. Um, so it's just kind of a build log of how I went about reformatting, retrofitting this old machine and putting it together. So. That's cool. Well. Scott, I wish you the best of luck. Try not to make a mess. Too late. <laughs> hey, Jason. Hi, Joel. You were here last year. I didn't get the chance to talk to you, but this uh, year, yes. I made sure to get over here. What is that? Okay, so this is a 3D printed uh, woodworking model. And uh, Chuck inspired me at Film and Friday. He had uh, went to a craft show that had something like this. And basically what it does is the handle comes up and it pops out. And you have uh, several you know, different uh, compartments. And then you fold it back down, and then you just have a nice design that can sit on your table. How does that work? Because there's nothing underneath to pull the other layers up. How does that work? So it's uh, it has a base, and it's glued onto the base. Ah, uh, okay. And that's how that works. And then the uh, if you look at the the cutting is actually at a slight angle. So when you pull it up, the layers catch the one below it. Uh, so that's okay. how it gets the compartment. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, are you going to explore more of this on your channel? Is this going to become a co kind of a, a thing or a project? Yes, it definitely is going to be, because this is definitely a beginning thing. I want to make it more decorative and do more different shapes, maybe circles or teardrops or stuff like that. So, oh, yeah. Cool. Thanks for showing me, oh, Thank you. Thanks for coming, Joel. I that. I could make it by this time. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Hey, Gordon. Hey, Joel. Hey, you're at Murph, I'm and at you Murph. brought the finished product. How'd it go? <laughs> it, it went pretty well. Um, the morning we left, we had a little bit of a tumble. Oh, what happened? <laughs> well, as you see here, it dropped. Oh, it did drop. <laughs> it did oh, no. An actual tumble. But it's like one of a zillion yeah, little that things, broke. Yeah. So percentage-wise, it's a success. You're right. It's like like one of 5,800 bridges. <laughs> it was like baseball players hit three out of 10, and they're considered great, right? So it's perfect. That's fantastic. And yeah. did you print two? Oh, well, that was the first one we printed, and that was my fault. But uh, this one we printed second, and it worked out great. So It's fantastic. Yeah. It looks... As you look at it, rotate it. I mean, it's it's kind of cool. And it's like like we said, stronger than you think. It's oh, it is. It is. <laughs> Here, we'll try it. Yes. Here, hold that. I hold this. Wow. <laughs> oh, I got a mic. I'm the one now. No, you need. Yeah. <laughs> wow, this is cool. Yeah, it's really neat. This is cool. I'm gonna put it down before I break it. Um, okay, so here, real quickly. What's going on here now? So now we're doing the longboard, which we actually printed for Maker Faire years ago. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing our, our own one now. Okay. PLA at first. We're going to go to uh, a Polymax, something hopefully stronger later. But so far, it's about halfway through the first layer, and it's getting there. <laughs> How's been, how has response been at Murph having the big printer here? Oh, it's been great. Once we got it running, it's been great. <laughs> <laughs> no, we actually had we had to try and print some cards this morning, so we had a 2D printing error. So I guess it's works. <laughs> no, it's been great though. Murph has been fantastic. Everyone loves the big printer. Well, I just want to tell you also, we used your axle in the car. Oh, is it? Yeah. I missed it. Oh. We're great. That's okay. There'll be a video. Uh, right? <laughs> I'll let you back to it. Thanks, awesome. Gordon. I appreciate it. Thanks, Joel. One of the staples of Murph is awesome stuff you get to see. And the printer bot printer belts is easily one of the cooler things that I've seen. How you doing, Bill? Good. How are you? Talk about this. How did, how did this become? <laughs> So last year at Murph, um, I showed off the uh, modified MakerBot replicator with I the conveyor that. belt. That's right. Uh, tilted conveyor belt, and um, 
That was just kind of a thought experiment for me. It allowed me to prove some of the software out for some of the other applications I'm working on. Okay. And uh, Brooke was here last year and I said, you know what, I would really like to see this in production. Why don't you make one? And so he said, okay, I'd love to. So um, this is the result after you know a few weeks of him and I working together. Uh, we, we knocked this out. He did the hardware, I did the software. I gave him some ideas on the hardware. Um, how is to this running Polar? It is. Polar 3D? Yes, it's actually running off the cloud. Um, so if I go to my phone on the cloud, I can go to the, the dashboard, which is the UI. Oh, okay. Right, so we have a camera view. Um, I can change filament, pause it, stop it, whatever, look at the temperatures, and do whatever I need to do. Um, but what, what we really want to see in the cloud is the ability to print multiple objects, right? Right. So this, this machine was designed explicitly for that. So we have a print queue, and in the print queue you can see I have a bunch of these gliders loaded up, and a couple of these other random parts. And um, so for example, let's say maybe I want this one to print next. I can actually go to the object, um, bring up the menu for it, and sell, send it to the front of the job. Oh, so queue management so, built right in. Built right in, yep. So. Um, now, in this case, if I scroll to the top, you'll see that the job that's printing currently is there, and then the next job is that part. And then, because it's the printer belt, is this done right yeah, here? Yeah, that part just, uh, that actually was just set on there, but this is an example of a completed part that just came off. Okay. So it has uh, what I call the leader, which is a... Um, is that a prime tower or it's a, priming, a, priming, a prime bead? But it also, it happens that if you do it sideways, it happens to be a good starting point to get the filament to stick. Because oh. we're printing it, the nozzle's not straight up and down, which, you know, on normal printers, it's already hard to get stick yeah. on some machines. But this is actually tilted at a 35 degree angle. So if you tilt it at 35 degrees, you're, you're tending to want to squirt the filament out yeah. <laughs> off the edge of it, right? That's true. So we put this leader on there, and that prevents that. Okay. And the leader just pops off. It, it, it literally just bends right off. And oh, just like, just like a, like a, like a brim. brim. Exactly like brim, yep. So it comes right off. Hey, Bill, I do have to ask, though. I mean, this is cool, Yeah. but I remember you talked about a paste kind of extrusion candy-making machine. Oh, the candy maker, yeah, yeah. Has there been any updates to that? No. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you. Of course there's been updates. Um, the, the original machine was actually built off the belt technology. And uh, in actually dealing with that machine, I realized there was a major problem, that if I'm building a machine for little kids, little kids should be able to know how to use it. Sure. Uh, and it turns out that they could make candy, and they could eat the candy, and when they took the candy off the belt, they tore the belt. They oh. had to be able to replace the belt. Okay. And that was very difficult. Sure. So I decided to uh, rethink that, and I was looking around, and I thought, well, what do kids know how to use that it's easy for them to use that would be easily accessible for them, things like that? And I realized that really a cookie tray is the best thing to print on. So really? I redesigned the entire printer, and that's what we have here. Oh my gosh. So. It's a cookie tray. It's, it prints literally on the cookie tray. That These little motors move the tray back and forth. Uh, we have the exact same nozzle and setup that I had before. The extruder's over here on the side. Um, all the electronics and everything are over here. It's using very inexpensive uh, Arduino Uno with CNC shield. And okay. the little 79 cent. Uh, oh, just a tiny little 24, motor. 24, yeah, uh, these little tiny stepper motors. So it's got five of those on here. Um, and. Uh, so it actually moves the cookie tray back and forth like a Prusa moves the build plate. Okay. So I call this the Prusa Mark IV. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> the, the tastiest uh, i3. Yes, exactly. And and the, so the the kids will they could easily swap the filament out or the uh, the uh, the cartridges oh, out. That was sim that was really simple. Yeah, you slide this up, pop this out, and. Oh, so they don't even have to disconnect hoses. They, they just need no, to, they take out the whole assembly. They take out the entire thing and swap it with a new one full of icing. Icing or... Is that a salted caramel? Yes, that's oh, a, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of caramel. Chocolate, and I've got fondant, and you can actually mix it with, with these uh, uh, cookie icing. The cookie icing actually hardens. Oh, yeah, and so, it's, it has so a nice this color, is, too. This stays soft, right? Right. And if you mix the two, it's soft enough to extrude, but then when you put it in the refrigerator, it solidifies, and then when you take it back out of the refrigerator, it's still a solid object. So it doesn't oh. melt. So it's wonderful when you mix them. Um, so you actually wind up with a good solid candy. That's cool. And kids love candy, right? Yes, they do. So that's kind of the idea. Cool, so Bill. Well, keep me updated because I like food and candy, <laughs> and I have kids. So there you go. I'll be your I'll be your beta tester. Uh, of course, of course. <laughs> have a good Murph, man. Thank you, sir. Good seeing you. Sure.
Ready, ready? Ready? Okay. Ready, what ready? What Just, this is going to be a quick thing, ready? Okay. Okay, okay. okay. You ready? Yeah. Okay, I have a mic, this is on you. Okay. okay. Hi, Lauren. Hi. I know you're known for making your Disney ears, but you've done a little something different for Murph. Can you talk about it? Yeah, so I decided to go with last year's logo because it was a little more printable in a okay. hollow ear, um, and they are interchangeable, so they just pop off. And there's is a little. Is it Velcro? It is. It's a dual lock oh. Velcro that's fully plastic. So it's not going to like wear out like normal Velcro will. Oh, okay. And then this one I decided to try something a little different and I made the little open source gear and it's uh, hollow underneath, which is super exciting. That's great. Yeah. That's a really cool design. Thank you. I mean, I, I love your Disney ears. I like Disney stuff too. Sean, you like Disney stuff too? Yeah. Don, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Who doesn't? But, but being able to expand the themes into other cool stuff like this, I think is going to make the ears not just more accessible, but more available. Yeah, it's a lot, it's fun. It's nice to customize things for what you want, not just necessarily Disney. Well, and that's what 3D printing is all about. Exactly. All right, can we talk later? Sure. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks. Jim is a wonderful person, no doubt, but Jim has this amazing filament product. Hi, Jim, can you tell us what we've got here? So, uh, the company's called Filablend, and what we do is we mix three colors of filament into the same strand, so then you can print a multicolored object in any printer that you want. And it's really, really cool. You get almost psychedelic effects as things rotate and turn, their colors morph. And instead of doing multiple extruders and multiple hot ends and extra electronics board and hacking your firmware, you just put the filament in any printer you want, and it's amazing. What is the process for creating this amazing filament? Can you tell so, us anything about it? So basically we're taking three rolls of existing filament and we melt them together. <laughs> so it's, it's very similar to a hot end and we're putting it through a filler winder then, which is another product on the market, uh, all open source products. And uh, it, it's been a lot of fun. It's slow and we need to figure out suppliers and, and figure out a lot of things, but it's amazing and people have really liked it. It's a manual process. Yes. Okay. And you, you type in your speeds and feeds and it goes until you tell cool. it to not go anymore. And, and then you sent me some. Yes. Yes. So it's I, probably waiting for you right it's now. It's probably waiting for me at home. So I'm really right. looking forward. What, uh, what's some advice on how I should print with it first? So it's just normal PLA. You shouldn't have to change your temperatures any special way or, or no. do anything like that. Okay. Uh, because it started out as filament and it's been melted once, it might behave more like recycled PLA. Oh, so I had really good luck with recycled yeah, PLA. Yeah, yeah, so add I'm a couple of worried. degrees, you know, no big deal. Um, we think it looks really good with vases. We're just starting okay. to experiment with solid things. Uh, oh, but try okay. it out, see what happens. It's, it's been a lot of fun and uh, I can't wait for this to be over and go play with it some more myself. <laughs> I'm looking forward to getting home. Jim, thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, Walter. Hey, how are you, Joel? You have, I'm well, thanks for asking. You're welcome. You have a crazy printer in front of you. Can you talk a little bit about it? Yeah, um, you know, when I, when I started, I, I got the ANET A8 because it was cheap. Did you make it safe? Yes, I made it safe. Okay. And, matter of fact, the bed's on here, and it's safe bed. Okay. But, you know, you'd start upgrading, you start upgrading, and then somebody came out with the AM8 kit. Well, the aluminum extrusions was over half the price of what I paid for the whole kit. So I'm like, you know, I think I can print that. And? So I stretched them out on the ANET <laughs> and printed the frame for the AM8. So that's it's basically so cool. what this is. Now it's I have so changed cool. the electronics. It's running a mini Rambo board. Oh, okay. You know, and I, and I do have some plans, and we can talk about those. If you have any questions, go ahead. You know, <laughs> it's your channel. Ask away. <laughs> well, I love the ingenuity behind it, right? I know I did my big open RC car, 100% 3D printed, other right. than like a metal piece to hold it. But people are like, "Why did you do it?" It's like, well, why not? I mean, why not try to make well, a 3D that, printed? That's printer? my point. You know, if it failed. I was out $25 worth of plastic, yeah. you know? So if it if I failed with the AM8, I'm out $85 worth of aluminum. So so being the proofs in the pudding, are these models printed on this machine? Yes. This, I mean, this is probably the best one that I have here because I give a lot of them away because this was like my first printer. You know, I had the A to 8, and then I built this one. But, you know, this is, this is not bad for a fully printed printer. Well, it's beyond not bad. It's yeah. it's a good print. Yes. You get people with so. non-3D printed printers making prints that don't look as good as that. Correct. I, and I agree with that. Um, and, I, you know, it took me a while to get it there. It wasn't it wasn't immediate. You know, it's like anything. You got to dial it in. And when I did some 
improvements right before Murph to clean up the wiring and all that. I broke a couple of pieces. You know better than to do things before Murph. <laughs> Man, Come on. Don't I know it? And at the end of my video, I was I was trying not to say cuss words really loud. I bet you were. But, <laughs> <laughs> but during that improvement, I broke some things and, and moved some things, and it doesn't print as good right now as it should, but this, but week, I'm, back. this week I'm tearing it down anyway. By the time you see this again, other than the videos I'm going to do to do it, it will be a printed Mark II. Ooh. I have a Arbello Mark 42 bed okay. and Penta Probe. So I'm going to redo this and reconfigure it like the Haribo I have down here. Okay. And it will be a printed Mark II running Mark II firmware. So if people want to follow along or see that, where can they go to find out more? Uh, it's Country 3D, K-U-N-T-R-Y, because, you know, we can't spell and it then in is the country. And that 3D or? 3D. No, 3D. it's the number, number 3D. Three. Okay. That's right. K-U-N-T-R-Y. 3D. 3D. All Perfect. one word. Twitter, Twitter and YouTube, that's all I do. Walter, thank you so much, man. Hey, Joel, I, I appreciate, appreciate you that. stopping by. I appreciate you bringing this to Murph. Take hey, care of your buttons. Yeah. Hey, take care of yourself, man. I can't even talk, <laughs> well, I can't even talk right now. Hey, man. I can't even Keep talk right now. making great content, and let's do this. High five. High five, baby. Good job, baby. There it is. I ran into Miles here at Murph, and he got something for me, but it's really it's it's really cool. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Uh, sure. It is a, uh, a brass cast uh, Murph coin with your logo on it. Or not quite your logo. I guess that's your little. Uh, it's one of my. It's my safety Joel. Your safety Joel. Yes. Safety Joel. Your safety Joel. What does brass cast mean? Well, brass cast means that I took a uh, masterpiece, uh, which would be right here. Uh, this is a uh, a positive of what I wanted to make. Uh, lasered it out. So this is just a piece of acrylic with a pattern I want on it. I would then uh, take it and I would uh, make a sand mold out of it. So using a flask and some uh, bonding sand uh, and a little bit of uh, baby powder as a release agent, I uh, made my mold. Uh, preheated my crucible, melted down the brass, and I was able to cast this. The mold is destroyed in the process, but because this guy exists, you can make as many of these as you want, so long as you have this uh, master. So then you just use this to make another sand cast. Exactly. And then you're on your way to this. Yep, and a certain amount of the sand is actually reusable. Oh. It's like uh, green sand, so it's uh, a certain layer of it is burnt away. But as long as you scrape that out, you can actually go back and reuse it in the next cast. Well, that's, oh, so less waste. Exactly. Cool. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Well, maybe I'll try this at home, Miles. I appreciate it. Awesome. I'm good, Murph. I will. Hi. We're back with Kelly, and the Joel bot is at a further stage of completion. How far away are you from having a completed Joel bot? Oh, I'd say maybe a couple hours or so. I'm gonna do the final details and then do go back in and do some antiquing and, and things like that. Make what it is look antiquing? Oh, it's a, just a process that I kind of use to go in and, and make the metal look a little more aged. I figured that you needed a little more rust little going rusty. on there. Yeah. Little steampunky, I think yeah. you said, right? Yeah. So uh, we're going to make him look a little rickety, a little creaky. Um, go back in with a wash of some different acrylics and go into the joints in the corners and things like that and make them look like they might be dripping with oil uh, and put in some patina on your logo, things like that. But much further than last time. He's it's making his way. Great. Thank you so much. What's, uh, what's one tip, if you, if you could think of one thing to offer someone who saw this and said, I would really love to be able to do that. What's, what's one thing you could tell someone that you think would make a difference? Just go for it. I would say definitely um, put in some sanding. Um, I, <laughs> I don't have the tam time to put in some sanding on him. Um, but if you want to make a, a metallic Joel bot, I would definitely recommend going with the rub and buff paint. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be putting on about four or five layers of acrylic. Uh, but definitely wear a mask for the fumes. Um, so if you want to make him metallic, go with the rub and buff um, and then go back in afterwards with some acrylics. He's looking great. Thank you. Great job on thanks. this. Uh, I've enjoyed painting him. We've had a good time. You say you got a few hours left to let you get back to it. Yeah, thanks. I'm Have excited to finish him. Good luck. Thanks. Murph is always the home of some crazy 3D printing innovations, and Tony here has something, well, it's crazy amazing. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Uh, first of all, this was designed by me and my friend Steve. I got to give him full credit for the initial design. Oh. Um, he came full up with to Steve. The, Steve White. He came up with the Core XY kinematics and in, in the overall shape and size of the printer. Okay. Um, the idea behind it is it's a duet based uh, Core XY. Um, the side panels are the enclosure are part of the frame of the construction. They add the rigidity. They're not an optional, you know, tacked on after the fact. Uh, linear rail based from the start, Core XY. Okay. Um, so the the linear rails were part of the core design. 
Uh, the latest thing we've added to it is we, we went to three independent Z screws uh, that are driven through the Duax 5. So they're actually independently driven to level the bed. So I, Now that's an amazing thing and I think more it, machines really could use that. It's one of those things where when I first looked at it I thought, yeah, that'll be cool. Once I had it, it's it's it is amazing. So when you level your bed manually, you might get it down to, you know, 0 0.1 millimeter, 0 0.05 on a good day. Yeah. Uh, this levels itself to 0 0.002 millimeters across a 250 millimeter Bed. Automatically. Automatically. Automatically on its own. And it, it, that's on the display right now. I did that this morning as a demo. I took it two millimeters out of level, ran three rounds of leveling, and it brought itself to 0 0.002. That's and so using that though. Once you can do that, so your nozzle is now flat to the bed plane. Right. And it's not calibrated, it's not it's actually flat to the plane. And that allows you to do things like print a 0 0.02 layer height print <laughs> every time. Every time. Every time. So I have a, a stack of prints here printed at 0 0.02 here at MRF. Uh, and it, it does it reliably. And it's because <laughs> <laughs> the leading and trailing edge of the nozzle are identically high to the bed. So this, this print is 413 layers. Uh, the first layer is a 0 0.05 layer height. Oh, because you want that first layer to be nice uh, and just fat, a right? Just nice fat, <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice fat at 0 0.05 and the rest of it is 0 0.02. 413 layers, a four hour print. And I printed, I think, four of them this weekend and they all come out identical. So the, 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 the ability to have the nozzle perfectly perpendicular to the bed is the key to it getting is, the quality? It is the key to 3D printing quality in general, in my opinion. So when your nozzle is not perpendicular to the bed, uh, you're plowing or, or dragging the filament. You're letting the filament extrude in a wedge instead of in a nice flat plane. And so, uh, you know, you end up doing things like, let's increase our first layer, let's make it wider, let's make it, you know, you're, you're compensating for a nozzle that's not perpendicular to the bed. Once you get it perpendicular to the bed, when you print your second layer, you're not plowing through that first layer anymore. Uh, so you don't get that screen door look. My first oh, layer okay. and my second layer look identical. They're all nice, even rows. It's not that screen door hatch look. Um, they're always nice, flat layers. And it does that layer after layer because oh. the nozzle is flat to the bed. That's cool. You know, you think about all the time e E3D takes to make these nice square nozzles and then we put them at an angle to the bed <laughs> you know we're defeating and, and calibration is nozzle. cool you know calibration overcomes the limits of the machines sure but the machine is more accurate than we are let it level itself it makes total sense so yeah it goes down to 0 0.02 if or 0 0.002 right um you can't do that by hand no you know you can't adjust a screw that small it so if one if someone wanted to actually make something or buy something like this what how would they go about doing so that? our approach uh we don't sell anything other than i will cut the the side panels on my cnc oh, um, okay uh because they're hard to source if you have a cnc cut them yourself if you know somebody with a cnc let them cut them um you can do them out of plywood if you want um but we don't sell anything instead we publish the bill of materials we publish four different uh versions uh there's 250 with and without the automatic leveling uh, and a 300 with and without the automatic leveling. Okay. A fifth version that's a 300 by 300 by 600 <laughs> is next. Uh, there was one of those here, but it, it will be documented. Okay. Um, and it's a open build materials, open assembly guide, and the Fusion 360 CAD models are posted as, as well as STLs. So download it, modify it, use any part you want, use you know as much as you want, change it, whatever it's all completely open so if i was going to build this myself which is what it would take how much am i looking to spend in parts uh on the 250 to the 300 between the four models posted it's between 1175 and 1250 in the bom as posted i think 1300 for the top the 300 with the automatic leveling is 1300. okay so it's now, not a low priced machine it is but, not but what you're doing is is you're you're paying for precision Absolutely, it's it's more rigid and more precise uh, was our goal, that's and, so and cool. that's what we went for. Dude, Tony, thank you so much, thank man. You, I Joel. appreciate this. Absolutely, we'll, we'll be in touch. This could be some fun build to do. That would be wonderful. Well, how do we grow this without going corporate? Do we grow it? I don't know. That's I guess that's really up to to you and others, right? So we're gonna let everybody have a couple weeks to settle down and recoup from Murph. And then we're going to send out some emails with some surveys asking for 
what do you guys want to see next year's Murph in the future look like? Because this is, we work for you. Me and Sonny do this. We just kind of come here and unlock the building and answer the questions. But this is the people's event, right? Sure. So do they want to see it get bigger, yes or no? If the answer is yes, we'll follow that path. If it's no, it's, it's good right where it's at. We'll stay there. Um, if we have to grow bigger, which I'm pretty sure I know the answer is yes, uh, we already have contingency plan. We started down that path this year and thought oh. maybe in limiting some, some sponsorships and limiting some attendee tickets would help keep the, the audience small enough to be manageable in this space. Right. 30,000 square feet, we ran out again. Yeah, we kind of uh, did. So I guess I know the answer to that question. We're still going to pose that question and let the people answer that. Okay. Well, John, I want to say, I really appreciate you unlocking the building and yeah. letting us in. Thanks for Murph. You bet. Give Sonny a high five for me. Will do. He already hit the road. They're I heading figured. home. He's yeah. got like a 10-hour drive. And just make it warmer next year, would you? Uh, well, coincidental, if we do the bigger building, we have to wait about two to three more weeks later in the year. Oh. So I'll promise you it might not be this cold. We could have an Easter egg hunt at that time. We could. We could. <laughs> Thanks, John. You bet. Have a good one. You too. Bye. Well, there we go. Murph, Midwest Rep Rap Festival 2018 is done. We're gonna turn off the lights really soon. I'm tired, I'm losing my voice. I had a great time. I hope you enjoyed all the footage. I, I hope you were here enjoying it yourself. If you weren't, don't worry. There will be another one next year. The car is all built. I just gotta figure out how to get it home. I'm tired, I'm gonna catch a flight. I love you all. As always, high five. Yeah, a little turn, a little zigzag, little zigzag. We're gonna turn, Joe, we're gonna turn. Bye.